I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Once again, I'm happy to bring you a new series on the podcast. This is my uh, Q&A sessions with um, my Instagram listeners, and I do these uh, Instagram lives every day, sometimes every other day, but I'm trying to do every day at, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And not only do I answer questions, but I also tell some stories that hopefully have some point to them. And in particular, in this one, I talk a little bit about how to make money making an online newsletter. And I start that conversation today. I go through all the basics about how to make an online newsletter, what kind of newsletters make money, um, some examples, how I've made money with newsletters, sort of best practices if you're making your own online newsletter. I do think if I was dropped into the middle of nowhere with no identity and no money, this would be the strategy I would most likely use to try to make a lot of money as quickly as possible. And of course, in addition to talking about that, I talk about many other things, but enjoy. And then tomorrow's or the next time I do the IG Live uh, on the podcast, I continue by talking about online courses, a little bit more about newsletters and so on. Almost have like a name for this show, the, the the Robin and James show. I'm putting your name first. Okay, well that's what you're supposed to be doing. Welcome to the Robin and James show. <laughs> today is I don't even know what day is it today. Is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? Or is it Thursday? Uh, so much stuff to talk about. Uh, uh, there's in, in, interesting things in the news. I want to add. I've been kind of optimistic in almost every major crisis. Like literally in 2008, 2009, they would laugh me off of CNBC because I was too optimistic. And he, and I've mentioned this before. Even my mom called me one time and said, maybe you should stop smiling while the rest of the world is going broke when you're on TV. But I said, this is the absolute time to be optimistic because the market's going to go up from here. And uh, yesterday, I think it was uh, Nouriel Roubini, um, I don't know. He's a famous economist. People call him Dr. Doom because he's always pessimistic. He's predicted 30 out of the last two recessions and he's always pessimistic. And yesterday he was calling for a depression. And I'm like, and I debated him in 2009. Uh, sorry, in 2010, I debated him uh, July 6, July 6, 2010. And he said the market was going to go down 40 percent uh, over the rest of 2010 and 2011. The market never went lower than that point ever. And I was saying it was going to go up. And so a few months later, there was a banker who wrote both of us 
and said, what, you know, James was clearly right. When are you going to invite James to one of your parties? And he has these huge parties. He has, a, I think, a loft in the East Village. Wow. And he has giant vaginas painted on the wall, apparently. And I've never been invited to one of his classic parties. And he said, I'm not inviting James until there's a recession. Well, now we're probably in a recession. We're definitely in a recession. But he's predicting a depression. And by the way, he's also tweeted out repeatedly over the years trashing me. And I just want to say, this guy's ridiculous. Like, we're not going to have a depression. There's major differences between our economic situation now and our economic situation in the 1930s. The Federal Reserve is is releasing a ton of money into the economy. The, you know, in, in the 1930s, they were taking money out of the economy because they wanted to reduce speculation. Now they're putting money into the economy. We're sending direct checks to people. We're going to have probably another stimulus package. So the economy is going to change, but it's not going to be a depression. And I don't say this often, but this guy, Nouriel Roubini, is just an idiot and, and he's lying. So there's not going to be a depression. I'd be happy to debate him again. I even wrote to CNBC and said, let me debate this guy, but we'll see what happens. And uh, uh, Victoria, you're right. He's not, he's not worthy. And uh, it's just, it's just an annoying guy. Like if I search Nouriel and Altucher, he like trashes me repeatedly. But, but I will say there's one thing, and you brought it up to me today too. There's one thing I'm a little pessimistic about, which is, you know, everybody's saying you can't reopen fully until there's testing and tracing. I don't think people understand what tracing means. And so uh, let me, let me, you know, if you look up a job description right now, there's something called the trace force, kind of like the space force, but trace. And the trace force is for people. If you get sick, the trace force looks at your phone data and your privacy data, finds out who you are near and starts calling them and suggesting they might need to quarantine. Well, ultimately, the trace force is going to have the power, and we see this on the job listings, Google trace force investigator jobs. They will have the power to contact people, escalate dangerous situations that they view are dangerous, and force you to quarantine or isolate even away from your family. Like they'll set up hotels and other rooms for you to force you to quarantine uh, away from your family. Uh, and if you don't do it, you could go to jail or get penalized. So I think this is a danger that's going to happen in this in the so-called new normal that I'm a little bit nervous about. I think that I've never been really pessimistic before because I always assume there's innovation in the economy and there's inventors and there's people who want to uh, solve problems and create new things. But when when you start hearing from the government that, hey, we might be able to force you you know, imprisonment, it just reminds me of the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise, where it's just clearly not a good thing. And that's not even the person that may have, you know, the C-19, it's the people that they're around. So you could just be somebody that you don't even know right. next to you that has it, and then you're going to be called, you need to be quarantined. And then you could go be quarantined for two two weeks, and then go out and do something else, and they call you if, if you're next to somebody else and they can tell you, you need to go quarantine again. So this could go on and on. You, they could quarantine one person if you're in a big city right. forever. Forever. <laughs> I mean, or, and by the way, they don't really have to give you a reason. They could say, right. hey, you were near someone who had who had a, a virus. By the way, whatever the next virus is, it might not even be coronavirus. You were ne next to someone who's been identified as having a virus. That's right. They could be making it up. We don't know where they could just wa want to clamp down on people. You know, this is not unusual in American history either. Like, don't forget John Adams, the second president of the United States, one of the writers of the Constitution. He created the Alien and Sedition Acts, which basically put in prison anyone who criticized him. So he, he put newspaper editors. This is in the 1803. He put sounds like China. Or, or 1799. Yeah, it sounds like China. He put newspaper editors who were critical of him in jail. Like people actually went to jail on these alien and sedition acts until it was ruled, you know, essentially unconstitutional. They repealed, they repealed these acts. So it's not unusual. And of course, during World War II, what did we do? We put into, we imprisoned all Japanese Americans. Right. Uh, you know, the Civil War was imprisoning people all over the place. Right. So 
it's not an unusual thing in American history, and the Constitution doesn't really protect against it. So it's just something I'm a little pessimistic about. Well, and plus, although we've evolved, you know, over these years, but now I feel like we're, you know, regressing in, in some ways, you know, with the tracing, with, you know, starting to be... Yeah. I don't know, that's just... Yeah, I mean, it's... You, I almost wonder, like, so just for the heck of it, on my podcast recently, two people used the phrase America 2.0. Uh, Mark Cuban used it on, and he's kind of been thinking of running for president on the Republican side. And Congressman Tim Ryan, a Democrat, also used the phrase America 2.0. So I got the domain name, America2o.com. And I almost think it's time to come up with a new bill of rights to kind of maybe solidify what, given how America has changed technologically and societally and just in terms of human rights and civil rights and, and you know, women's rights and, and rights all over the place, workers' rights, maybe a new bill of rights is needed or at least clarify the old one because a lot of these things are constitutional. So here's a story. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the mathematician uh, Kurt Gödel. So there was a famous book, Gödel Escher Bach. Gödel was this famous mathematician and he and Albert Einstein were best friends when they both lived in Princeton. So at one point, Gödel was going to go um, get sworn in to be a U.S. citizen. He wanted to be a U.S. citizen. And he he's, on the morning he's supposed to be a new citizen, he goes up to Einstein and Einstein says, hey, are you ready? You know, they interview you. The judge interviews you to be a citizen, to just determine that you're loyal and, and patriotic and everything. And Gödel's like, oh, yeah, that's great. I, In fact, I'm going to even help America out. I found a contradiction, a mathematical contradiction in the U.S. Constitution. And Albert Einstein's like, look, maybe I need to go with you to the court. And so they go to the court. This, it's the same judge that made Einstein a U.S. citizen. So, so the judge is, he, his name's Philip something, I forget his name. The judge is interviewing Gödel and and said and starts to get into you know do you swear to uphold the constitution and Gordon was like yes and, and in fact i found a contradiction in the u.s constitution and the judge looks at einstein and einstein says just say yes <laughs> and so einstein had to c correct his friend the most famous mathematician in history and Gödel became wow. a u.s citizen but here's the contradiction he found which is still exists which basically Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution says any part of the Constitution can be amended. And that's why we have all these amendments. But that means Article 5 can be amended. And so it's a, Gödel was famous for what's called these recursive loops. So when something could modify itself, that's called recursion. And so the Constitution can modify itself to basically be a more fascist version of itself and that's what he was pointing out, is that yeah. the, he's basically said the Constitution could potentially lead to a fascist society. And that's the danger. The, fa the Constitution is almost like a blueprint. But if you follow it exactly, it could be very, very dangerous, which is why there's always amendments and there's always the Supreme Court deciding. And it's very important who the Supreme Court justices are and, and so on. So anyway, that's history lesson about Einstein and Gödel and the Constitution. <laughs> but I wonder if... If you were, I'm, I'm curious, you could tweet this out or on this IG Live or whatever. If you could make a new, a, a, a new Bill of Rights, what would be some of the rights that you would maybe include or amend or whatever? Put it on Twitter, tag either R. Altucher or J. Altucher. And I'm curious because I want to start compiling this and thinking about it. Um, but it's something to always be aware of. The Constitution is not necessarily there to protect us we also have to protect the Constitution in order for American yeah. society to work. Uh, and so that's why I'm a little pessimistic on this uh, tracing because I think everything starts off with good intentions and then bad things happen. So for instance, the fact that in 1965, Lyndon Johnson passed all the laws so that the federal government will back student loans, that has really great intentions. Let's get all Americans to have a higher education. That was his philosophy, great intention. But what was the result? The results were bad. The results were tuitions, ever since he signed that law, tuitions every single year have gone up faster than inflation. So now, why, you know, 
why do you have to pay? I mean, tuition then was like $1,000. Now it's $75,000 a year, as I said yesterday, to go to Harvey Mudd College. Here's what happens in college. I don't need to, I don't need to give a college $75,000 a year just so my daughters, our daughters, could have a lot of sex every year. They could do that for free, basically. Like, everyone says, oh no, socialization, they'll learn how to socialize. Trust me, if you put a, an attractive 19-year-old girl on the streets of New York City, they're gonna figure out how to socialize. They're not gonna not socialize. And by the way, college is the last time in your life that you're friends with people your own age. So it doesn't, like, are you, we're not even the same age. We're, we're, you don't, you're not friends with people your own age. I'm not friends with people my age. I barely know anybody my, exactly my age. So college is like a false sense of socialization. And people say, oh, well, college lets you learn the liberal arts. No, I didn't start reading until after college. And then I got obsessed with reading when it became something I was, you don't remember things if you're not interested in them. Uh, and, and we've talked before about how to find your interests and passions, but like, what else is college good for? My kids tell me, oh, college is good for getting a job. No, Mo a lot of big companies like Google, for instance, the biggest company has said, we're not gonna look at college degrees anymore to determine if you have a job. So it's skills and ideas are more important than a certificate you hang on the wall. I mean, one of the first things, I don't know, I don't even know if Lisa's on this one, but one of the first things, when I was throwing out all my belongings, the first thing Lisa threw out was my framed diploma and burned in the fire. Like, God, I didn't need it. What do I need it for? And you know, when I, when I had a problem, I had a problem once with my credit score, and it's because after all the money I had given Cornell and I paid back my debt and everything, I owed like $1,000 in library fines. Uh -huh. And that was because of the interest. I really owned owed yeah. like fifty dollars, but over twenty years it became a thousand dollars, and that was affecting my credit score. I almost couldn't buy a house in nineteen ninety nine because of that, and I had to pay a company two thousand dollars to fix my credit score from like five eighty to seven eighty, which, by the way, shows you how bullshit credit scores are. That I could just pay someone to have so I could have perfect credit. That is amazing. I didn't know that. Credit scores are a scam. Colleges are a scam. Uh, the yeah. FDA is a scam. The FDA recalls 4,500 drugs a year. So what good are their clinical trials if they're recalling all their yeah. drugs? It's all a scam. It's just though, it's just part of the system. What do you think is one job that is not a scam? One job? Yeah, just kidding. not a scam? Yeah, I can't, I can hardly think of any. Uh, doctor? Well, but doctors, doctors are a scam because because the doctors are scam because they're entertained by pharma companies. Oh, here's the prescription well, yeah. you should I mean, you should is, prescribe. Everyone is uh, I'll, painted. I'll, I'll, no, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Mm. So a busker on the street, like someone pay, playing the guitar on a street corner, mm -hmm. and he has a hat out, mm -hmm. and you put a dollar in. I don't think that's a scam. No one's putting a dollar in unless he's a good guitar player. Right. What that's else true. is not a scam? Um, well, I don't know. Someone that really loves their job. Maybe that's helping people. I mean, it just depends on the like person, what? right? That's scamming. Are you, you see scamming for money? You know, I, I don't know. Yeah, like lawyers are a scam maybe because like they're always defending. If it, there's, psychologists, maybe therapists. Uh, I don't know. No, here's why, I think, here's why I think therapists are a scam is because the therapist is the one kind of doctor you go to where you're never cured. Like you go to that doctor forever. And so they have kind of an incentive Okay, next week we'll talk about your issues with your mother or whatever. Right. No, that shouldn't be. So, so like, that, they all do that. Yeah, I mean, I everybody I know who goes to a therapist been going to a therapist, including me, for twenty years. That's crazy. So, but most doctors, you know, so that's the the therapist. And I'm not saying therapists are not good people, but I'm just saying the industry itself has this has elements of a scam. Again, yeah. I think my therapist is great, but the industry itself. And I'm not saying every doctor is influenced by pharmaceutical companies, but the industry itself has some scam-like elements. Lawyers, they'll just, you know, if some company just spilled oil in, in the Atlantic Ocean, but they're willing to pay $5 million for a law firm, that law firm will take the client. Yeah. So so what what's an industry that's not a scam? I don't know. I mean, research is needed, but, you know, of course, they're in the pockets of big pharma. Yeah, and also science, you know, re a lot of research 
they want to monetize their research or they want funding for their research. So just think about, I remember in the 70s and the 80s, computer science departments wanted funding from the Department of Defense. So what did they do? They created this phrase, artificial intelligence, and eventually <laughs> computers would be as smart as humans. It's so ridiculous. Like, yes, you can have a computer that can beat, you know, any chess player, but it can't taste an apple. That same computer can't taste an apple and tell you if it tastes good. Like, there's no such thing as artificial intelligence. And, and yet they use that phrase to kind of, oh, we're going to make robots that are like humans. And it's just ridiculous. So that's all a scam. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just think humans are just lean more towards scamming. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, that, I mean, because it's all about survival. The housing like, industry is all a scam. Like the idea that you need like a, 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 to live in the suburbs and have a white picket fence, which by the way, is great for many people. But the phrase, the American dream, I think came out of a, a Fannie Mae marketing slogan trying to convince people that the American dream was the white picket fence and the suburbs and commute to work. And the biggest source of stress for many people who commute to work is the length of the commute once they moved to the suburbs. Now, maybe that'll be over when we work remote. <laughs> now, that's part of the new normal right. is, you know, but what yeah. else? What else is a scam or not? They're all scams, basically. <laughs> except for except for guitar buskers on the street. I don't know. We put John out on the street to play his guitar in China. Did he make money? Yeah, he made a ton of money. Well, see, Chinese they, people they, well, like they've his never guitar seen playing. that before. Here's this this Westerner, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed kid playing a guitar that's ten years old. So, so basically, in China, what isn't a scam? is being a white person and standing on a corner <laughs> yeah. with a hat out saying, please give me money. That's not a scam. Because I don't think John's, he's probably not a bad guitar player, but he's probably not like, No, he wasn't you know, great. He's just learning. But he thought that was really great. He right. just had so much. So it wasn't a scam. That He, he did something. That he, he busked. And it wasn't his guitar skills. It was basically, he was this unusual white That's person right. standing on a corner yeah. in Chengdu, China. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> He drew a crowd. There were so many. And I feel like clothes, the clothing industry is a scam because have you ever been to a fashion show? It's the ugliest clothes you've ever seen when you yeah. go to a fashion show. Like the whole fashion industry true. is a scam. <laughs> you know, the book industry, I don't know. I think that's getting more democratic with, with Amazon. But movies are a scam. Now the only movies that that do well are like special effects. Uh, I mean, of that... The Avengers is was certainly a scam. Like Avengers Endgame was, was a scam. I don't care if you saw it or not. Thanos was an, was a climate change environmentalist, and the Avengers killed him for it. Thanos said the exact same thing Bill Gates is apparently saying in Pandemic, <laughs> which is that we need to cut the number of people in the universe in half, and then the environment of the universe will be better. And so he killed off half the universe. He, 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 you see him in the Avengers Endgame, he's just planting his gardens. That's all he wanted him to do, kill off half the universe and then he could be a farmer again. And then the Avengers, like Iron Man has to kill him all of a sudden, like we gotta kill this environmentalist named Thanos. So Avengers is a scam. Uh, anyway, I'm in, I'm in scam mode today. What's not a scam? Jay, if anybody says anything not a scam, put it on the IG Live link and uh, uh, let's see what's else on the IG Live. Uh, HXCC10R, what biographies would you recommend reading? Really interesting question because I do think, first off, um, let me darken the screen a little bit. Where's my screen darkening function? Hold on. I don't like to be so bright. Uh, okay, I would read, first off, I like, I like books that are aggregations of many biographies. So read Robert Greene's book, Mastery, or The 48 Laws of Power, where he'll go over so many biographies when he explains about his concepts of power or, or mastery and so on. Another one is, um, uh, uh, I just finished reading uh, These Truths by Jill Lepore, which is a history of the United States, which is so interesting. Um, but biographies are really interesting because you could read them and absorb the lessons of the person of uh, You don't have to live that person's life You could be like a vampire and absorb 
the life into yours and take the kind of most important points of that person's life when you read a biography and, and integrate that into your own life. So I've read a lot of biographies of investors. So Warren Buffett, you know, the book Buffett by Roger Lowenstein is great. Uh, the book uh, Titan about John is a biography of John D. Rockefeller by Ron Chernow. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt by John by Ron Chernow. Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson. There's a bunch of biographies by Robert Caro. Uh, uh, you know, there's a Truman by David McCullough uh, is interesting. I don't know. I'm trying to think uh, what other biographies I've read. I, again, I've read a lot of aggregations of biographies like Sick in the Head by Judd Apatow is not only Judd Apatow, the famous comedy movie writer and director, but he interviews all these comedians ever since he was a little kid and he he writes about it. Uh, Tools of the Titans by Tim Ferriss, chapter on me in there. I like I like that book. I'm trying to think of what other straight biographies I've read recently. I don't know, what have, what have I got back here that's biography? Um, I don't know, I'll think of more, uh, but I like these aggregations of, of biographies. Uh, I'll do another question. Um, uh, here's, Oh, gray hair man, 49. Hi, James and Robin. I enjoy your informative talks. One question. Do you read the Bible for quotes? I love the Bible for quotes. Yeah. I love Proverbs. Yeah. Proverbs. The book, the book of wisdom. Is, is Was Proverbs uh, like, so I think that's Solomon's mm -hmm. quote. Solomon. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so there's 31, I believe there's 31 uh, chapters in uh proverbs so it's a it's really a great book yeah mm -hmm. who who do they think actually wrote the book of proverbs is there someone in like solomon's court no king solomon well that's what they say but i'm wondering if i don't have any idea so so uh there was a guy speaking of biographies there was a guy harold bloom who wrote a a, a, a pseudo biography called the book of jay and it was about a mythical character named jay who he assumed not J A Y, not this J, but just the letter J. And he he assumed that someone working for King Solomon actually wrote the Old Testament, including Proverbs. But Could it's be. just it's just a theory. We don't know. Yeah. And I myself have not read the Bible in a while, but I do like reading um, older texts like the Tao Te Ching or the Analects of Confucius or Chuang Tzu's uh, book about Taoism or various Hindu books. And again, I like them not just for the quotes, but for the stories, the inspiration. And I do think it's always interesting to read those books when you're writing your own book, because you could kind of borrow from that structure. Like we all, we know that for 3000 years, people thought that this book structure was a great book structure. So I like, so, yeah. so it will work now too. It's just like the other day, yesterday, I was talking about if you if you take the song "Stayin' Alive," the most popular disco song in the '70s, mm -hmm. and put a '90s hip hop beat on it, it'll be a successful yeah. hip hop song, which is what the Fugees did. So if you take the structure of the Bible, or the structure of the Tao Te Ching, or the structure of a Buddhist famous Buddhist book, mm -hmm. we know because that was the hit of right. 400 BC. It'll be a hit now. So right. so for instance, Zen and the Art of Archery is a hit book. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is a hit book. The Tao of Pooh is a hit book. So the, the Inner Game of Tennis is a hit book, and it's based on Buddhist uh, mm -hmm. theology. The Legend of Bagger Vance by Stephen Pressfield is a, no it's a novel, and it became a movie with Will Smith and Matt Damon. It's a novel about 1920s golf players in, in Georgia. That The entire structure, scene by scene, is taken from the Bhagavad Gita mm -hmm. without him mentioning it. And he only mentions it much later. So when you take these ancient structures that are successful or quotes and apply them to modern days, it's a very successful formula. It's almost like how a similar idea to how if you take a cert, if you take Google, but then put it in Russia and they created mail.ru, mm -hmm. uh, it's a successful model because it was successful here. It's going to be successful right. in Russia. If you take Google here and you put it in China, which is Baidu in China, it's a successful model. It's a good way to come up with a successful business is to take an older model that works somewhere else and bring it to somewhere it doesn't exist. Same thing with books or quotes. If I could take an, or songs, if I can take something that's older, that was a hit and bring it into the present day, 
boom, it's a, it's right. a, a success. It's a formula for a bestseller. So, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, are we entering the post? So this is from Uranci 99, Y U R A N C Y 99. Um, are we entering a post COVID-19 world? What do you think? Yes. Right now? I think right now, actually. Well, it's interesting because you go outside of New York City, everybody's outdoors. Mm -hmm. It's crowded. The streets are crowded, right. but the stores are closed. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's going to kind of be the new normal, which is that a lot of stores are going to close down. And at least in New York and other states, I hear it's starting it's, to be a little bit more normal. Yeah. But everybody's still worried. Like even in states like Arizona that had almost zero deaths, there's still the restaurants. I think it's maximum 50 percent capacity. You know, in Florida, people are still are wearing masks. And I shouldn't say still, like maybe it's appropriate. Maybe it's not like every day. I feel like the CDC and the who changes their mind about what's good for people, yeah. which, you know, again, I feel like the whole area of experts is a scam because sometimes people who are experts at epidemiology aren't experts at virology. So they might be experts on the chemical structure of coronavirus, but still don't know how the virus is transmitted. Everybody's kind of an expert down their lane, but they comment on all the other lanes. Right. You can't drive in four lanes at once. Yeah. No. You get a ticket, speeding and then, ticket. And then the hands are, the pockets, they're in their pockets of uh, these, these people too, you know, the, the governments and such, I think. Oh yeah, like Neil Ferguson, every day he was coming up with new numbers, depending on, I think, which government was paying him the most. Like, mm -hmm. again, the whole mathematical modeling That's industry. Terrible. We should set up, here's a business, let's set up, a, we're going to call it, <laughs> Uh, a modeling agency and but now it's like instead of like female pretty models you just have math for any cause you have mathematical models right and just present that to governments you know oh you need a mathematical model that right. shows this here you go i'll send over a model right away scientifically based um but i do think we're in a uh, I, th I do think we're heading towards a post covid 19 economy where again the the main important themes are acceleration Everything that would have happened in 10 years is going to happen now. So if if self-driving was going to happen in 10 years, self-driving is going to happen next year or, you know, or auto driving or whatever. If, um, uh, you know, if JCPenney's was originally going to go out of business in 10 years, it's going to go out of business now. If Barnes & Noble was going to go out of business in 15 years, it's going to go out of business. I'm absolutely sure. I bet you Barnes & Noble will be out of business within the next year. If couples were going to get divorced in 10 years, they're going to get divorced coming out of this quarantine. Divorce is going to go through the roof after this quarantine. Anything, anything with a shaky foundation. Yeah. And marriage could be very shaky. We're both on our third marriage, but <laughs> we're not getting, don't, unless she divorces me, we're not getting a divorce. No. I'm not divorcing her no. because I got lucky. And, and so did I. You, did, you always say that. It's true. You we did not. Lucky. If I were you, I would not take that attitude into a casino or you will lose a shitload of money. Like, you're not as lucky as you think. I'm the lucky one. Just just, just leave it like that. Um, but acceleration is an important theme. Uh, remote is an important theme. We're going to get, instead of all of us meeting in person, we're meeting on IG Live. And remote work is happening all over the place. I don't think companies are paying lip service that people are going to start working remote. Less, less affairs at the workplace and probably less productivity. Like I think if I had a regular job, I would not work as much if I was working from home. Like I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't give a shit about work if I was working <laughs> at home. I'd work like 12 minutes a day. Um, and I do, but I, but, well, I do think people are going to be a lot more entrepreneurial. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot more side hustles. I think the skill you've got to develop is how to turn side hustles into a business. So for instance, if you're a virtual, you know, here's a good side hustle. You could be a virtual assistant. So there are websites like Virtual and other sites where you could say, hey, I'll be your virtual assistant. I'll handle travel arrangements for you or I'll handle um, buying gifts for clients or getting back to people, keep track of your schedule. But imagine if you're a virtual assistant and you say to people, hey, I've been doing this, this, and this for you, but I noticed you're not really updating your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter, your LinkedIn. I'll do that for you. And then you could take that service and start to scale it and do it for many people. And now, now suddenly you're a social media agency and not just 
our virtual assistant and you hire people cheaply in India to take care of a lot of the basic virtual assistant stuff and now you're suddenly an agency and you build a business. So I think any side hustle, you could potentially turn into a business. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's 
$10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So I want to quickly talk about how to make an online newsletter because I'm blown away honestly, by this one website I've been visiting. First off, in the past few years, I've made a good amount of money creating an online newsletter business. And I'll, I'll describe how I did it, but I think you should all check out substack.com, S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K.com. It, it, I was just playing around with it a few weeks ago, and within five minutes, I was able to set up a four-pay subscription newsletter, which kills me because in 2009, with a friend of mine, we actually created the software to do this and we did nothing with it and let it die. But Substack.com, it's really easy. You just sign up, you say, I wanna accept payment, I wanna charge this, and then you're done. It starts wow. accepting credit cards for you. And then I used to think the only way to succeed with a, a four pay newsletter, I used to think, I don't think this anymore, you have to be in one of three categories, get paid, get laid, lose weight. So get paid means an investment newsletter, like an investment newsletter about stocks. Get laid means like, you know, a newsletter to help people, to help guys pick up girls. Women don't really need the help. And get uh, lose weight is a diet newsletter. So those three categories dominated the newsletter industry. But I go to substack.com and there's a list of the top paid publications. And I can't believe like, here's one called, um, uh, here's one called Thinking Better. Thousands of subscribers paying $8 a month, and, and this person writes at the intersection of philosophy, science, and art. People are willing to pay $8 a month for that. Or here's one, Nicole Knows by Nicole Cliff. And the, the subject is, I just feel like I can help your whole deal be a little better. And she has thousands of subscribers paying her $5 a month. Um, here's one, News Items by John Ellis. And it's just interesting, important news. Thousands of subscribers paying $10 a month. Here's one, The Ankler. I don't even know how he get, got that name. The Ankler by Richard Rushfield. The newsletter Hollywood loves to hate and hates to love. Thousands of subscribers, $10 a month. Uh, there was one I saw about parenting also. Um, here's one. Oh my gosh, this one's The Macro Tourist. It's an almost daily email. Oh, okay, this one's about markets. It's thousands of, hundreds of subscribers paying $35 a month. Uh, this one's a weird one. It's called The Corners by Nadia Boltz Weber. Thousands of subscribers paying $5 a month. What's it about? Grace for fuck ups. That's it, that's what it's about. And people, thousands of people paying $5 a month. Um, here's one. The third most popular newsletter on Substack is called Popular Information by Judd Lagoom, Independent Accountability Journalism. Oh, you would like this one. Get Smarter About China, Sinocism, Sinoism by Bill Bishop. Thousands of subscribers paying him $15 a month. You should start a newsletter. I know. It takes you five minutes. Yeah, well, do I like, think I'm gonna do that today, actually. Yeah, just start listing the things, yeah. like all the kind of scams happening right. to that, be aware of. That I experienced. Yeah, or, so or but you also know all the up-to-date information yeah. due to all your like CIA contacts and everything. You should just do the CIA China newsletter and charge $20 a month or something. I don't know. It seems like this is... So here's how, if I was going to start a four-pay newsletter, figure out where you have a unique perspective. Again, is it investments? Is it diets? Is it fantasy sports? Is it China? Is it poker? Is it 
the, you have an interesting twist on the news or if you or do you have fun movie and TV reviews? I don't know. Just the, you have great cooking recipes. Yeah. I don't know. And then here's always remember with a four pay newsletter, I'm going to tell you a list of what I think are best practices. A, create a lot of valuable content for free and put it everywhere. So go to Medium, go to LinkedIn, go to Quora, go to the Huffington Post, as many places as you could find, post articles for free. Then drive people to a free email newsletter. You can set up a free email newsletter on Substack. So it doesn't have to be for pay, it could also be for free. Drive people to a free newsletter where it's every day, good, valuable content for free. And then use the free newsletter to drive people to a more premium for pay newsletter. So for instance, if I was going to write about fantasy sports, I would just answer all the questions on Quora about fantasy sports. Uh, and every week I would answer questions. Oh, pick this guy, pick this guy. Then I'd say, hey, if you want more, here's my weekly picks. Go to my weekly free newsletter. And then, hey, if you want real detailed explanations of how I'm what my resources are and how I'm finding my weekly picks and more advanced picks and how to think about the whole season and blah, blah. here's my four pay newsletter, $15 a month. And you get thousands of subscribers. So start thinking now, like what are subjects, like for instance, here's a great idea for a, do a newsletter about side hustles or do a newsletter about uh, coronavirus compliance, which we talked about the other day. Do a newsletter about uh, uh, you know, new technologies, you know, in, in, in the new normal or, or a newsletter about genomics. And here's the stocks for genomics in the new normal. Uh, what are some other ideas for newsletters? Um, I don't know. I would, I would put out like, here's a newsletter idea, business idea of the week. So it's not just side hustles, but it's an entire business idea fully fleshed out. Or here's another one, a new 30 day book challenge every week. So yesterday I gave a 30 day book challenge. I don't know if anybody started yet, but pick a category you like, whether it's history, politics, golf, sports, business, billionaires, cooking, China, parenting, and then list on your waiter's pad, the hundred best people in history in that category. Here's the hundred best chefs in history. And then write the book, The 100 Best Chefs in History. So every day, uh, let's say I'm gonna write The 100 Best Chefs, because let's say I loved cooking and I loved studying the history of chefs. The 100 Best Chefs in History, I'll put each chef, maybe a little bit of their bio, maybe some quotes that inspire me from them, if they have, some of their favorite recipes, I'll put in the book, and then maybe my own story of like why I like them, or what happened to me personally when I was making those recipes. And then in a month, you'll have your hundred best. Go to 99designs.com, look, get a cover, say, hey, I need a cover. I'm going to pay a hundred dollars. I need a cover for hundred best chefs in history. And then upload it to Amazon and boom, you have a Kindle and a paperback. You read it in a studio and you have an audible and boom. And then by the way, at the back of your book, put a link to your newsletter to get the next hundred chefs subscribe to my newsletter at chefs.substack.com or whatever, whatever you call That's it. Great. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. You could do the hundred best parents. We talked about this is the hundred best mm -hmm. parents in history. Think of your category. You, this is the time. I don't want to give anybody a homework assignment, but this is the time to do something like that. Uh, and you, all the tools are available by the way, just because Amazon exists, YouTube exists, something like Substack exists. These business models have existed forever. They're not just existing right now. Like you, you, you in, in the 1920s, there was a guy, if you Google this, I forget his name. If you Google this, the little blue books, this guy would take books like, you know, war and peace. And he would summarize them in these tiny little blue books that you could put in your pocket. And, and then he would publish them to like drugstores. And he sold over a hundred million of these blue books. He basically took every book and he would make the title as sexy as possible. Like instead of being a war and peace, he would call it like war and sex. And, <laughs> and he would rewrite war and peace and say by Leo Tolstoy and summarize it. 
and sell it to, and you can buy it in drugstores. Yeah. And now people collect these blue books, but he sold a hundred million wow. books that way. Yeah, that's really neat. And if people say, oh, I can't write a book in 30 days, here's an example. Barbara Cortland, look her up. She wrote 760 books, romance novels. She was writing two books a month, complete novels. And because they had a similar formula and similar structure. Yeah. And when she died, they found 160 unpublished novels in her attic wow. because she just was so prolific. She died right. at like at the age of 92, something like that. Wow. Uh, Isaac Asimov wrote 467 books. So including some of my favorites, the Foundation uh -huh. Trilogy, science fiction books. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, so, so uh, Danger H asked the question, how would you go about building a major career outside of a major hub city? So New York City, LA, Chicago, San Francisco are like hub cities. Mm -hmm. You know, Miami is a hub city. Do an online newsletter or do one of these book challenges or be a virtual assistant and we just gave you a bunch of ideas, but look, you were in Austin, right? And you started the biggest hair salon in Austin when you lived there. How did you do it? Um, how did I do it? Well, I just had a, a vision. I wanted to create something, a, an environment for people to come in and have their hair done and get their nails done and get facials. That wasn't really done back then. You know, was there, was, there wasn't a place that everybody could get everything? No, not at that point. And and so so you you were unique in that you were doing all these services, right? And we then offer all these services. And then how else were you unique? Like what was your kind of how did people hear about you? Uh, well, when I hired uh, my my employees, we, well, first of all, we had seventy employees. And seventy employees, you managed 70, them. Seventy, yeah. Well, no, I, I hired a manager, uh, but uh, so those employees came with a clientele, so we were from the beginning um, profitable. So, so if you had a like a hairdresser who had a big client list, did you have to pay them more because no. they were bringing over their client list? No. Nope. Like, did you have to like bribe them away from some other salon? Like, well, how would you get them to leave where they were to come to work for your salon? Because of what we offered them in terms of what the place looked like, we actually had health insurance. So yeah, we did we we did things for them that they didn't have at the other places. Like, so, so health insurance, what do you mean, like, how the place looked? Like, did you have a, was so it, it was very upscale? Nice, very upscale, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the location was great. Uh, and so, yeah, they were able to get benefits. And some of them, we gave them more commission. Some of them were on commission, some were at least. So we was it hard it to manage 70 hairstylists? It was very difficult. Were, were any of the hairstylists, like, having sex with their customers? Uh, no, I don't. You don't know about it? Mm -hmm. What about like, I always imagine like in a hair salon, everybody, all the people hear all the gossip of the city. Like what gossip That's would you true. hear? We heard a lot, but I can't say. Anything. Oh, don't say anything specific, but like what's like the most extreme gossip you ever heard at running a hair salon? Well, I mean, there were people that were running around and, and you know, I, I, I can't, this is a while back. So, I mean, very promiscuous people, a few. Would you would you find the male clients to be more promiscuous or the female yes. clients to be more promiscuous? Males. So like what would how like I would imagine though the hair salon was mostly women. Like what would happen? Like how would you how would the men come in and tell you, oh yeah, I'm with my mistress I'm going here and with my wife I'm going here. Well, I don't think we would. Well, we wouldn't hear it that way. We would just hear from the the wives. <laughs> really, my husband left me, or my husband did this. Oh yeah, and and what what was the most extreme? Like, would the wife hear like my husband was cheating on me for twenty seven years and I never knew, or my husband was a sex addict and I never knew? Like, what was the most extreme you would hear? I, I I can't remember a lot of that. I just you know you're like a black hole when you're dealing with public like that. You just you just take it in and it never comes out. You yeah. just can't. But they trusted you though. They did, and they they should. All right. Well, I'll never tell the secrets. Uh, someone just asked, um, who are business leaders I respect? And that's such an interesting question because on the whole, I don't really respect any business leader <laughs> because even if you take Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett at the exact same time, he's saying, you know, America's great. He was selling almost half of his stocks. So 
you know, or, or I remember in 9-11, right after 9-11, he said he was on CNBC and, you know, he always sounds like everybody's grandfather. He always sounds like this nice Nebraska guy. He loves to eat steak and French fries and Coke. Uh, and he was saying on CNBC, there's a hundred percent chance a nuclear weapon will be dropped on the United States within the next 50 years. And you think, oh my gosh, if Warren Buffett says it, it must be true. But then you realize he's owns the biggest insurance companies in the world. He started offering nuclear attack insurance for the Super Bowl, for the Olympics, for all these events. So he was just saying that to make money. And he's by scaring me and everybody else. So I kind of lost a little bit of respect for him. And I used to really admire him. Um, I really admire uh, this guy, Joe Moglia. So he worked at he was he he's, he's he was the CEO of TD Ameritrade, and he he made them into a multi billion dollar company from nothing. And then here's what I respect about him: he got tired, and he didn't want to make any more money, and they kept offering him more and more money. And he's like, no, 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 I quit. And you know what he did? He wanted to be a football coach, and he couldn't get a job as a football coach, even though he had been the CEO of this major bank. He couldn't get a job as a football coach. So here's what he did. He offered to be, he went to the University of Nebraska team. The coach's name was Bo Polina. And he said, Bo, can I be a coach for you? And Bo was like, nah, I don't, I don't need a coach. I'm the coach. And so he worked as an assistant. He would run, get coffee for the coach. Wow. He'd get coffee for the players. He would take notes on all the plays. He would watch all the games and take notes and so on. He was just like an intern for the coach for a year or two years. And then he got a job for a small football team, then a bigger football team. And then finally, he was the head coach for Coastal Carolina University. And he helped he helped them win the Big South Conference. I don't know anything about football, but I like the fact that I respect the fact that he was on top of industry, the whole finance industry. He was like the king. He took five steps back. He, he realized life is short. He pursued what he was interested in. I think he, he might have gotten a divorce in the process, but I'm not sure. Uh, and he, he, he went all the way back to his roots uh, and started from the bottom. Now he's there. Mm. And he became a top. He only just last year he retired and he was a successful football coach finally after all those years. So I respect I respect something like like that. I mean, is there any business leader you read about I, that you respect? Well, I, I really love um, Condoleezza Rice. Okay. I, I mean, I just love her character. I she's brilliant. She's, you know, a very humble what she, person. She, what's she, she doing now? Is she a business I'm person? I'm not sure what she's doing now, but yeah, she was like on the board with Chevron. She worked for Chevron and uh of course she, you know, was in government, but I don't know what she's really doing right now. She was also I really a, think she's an amazing person. She was also a concert pianist and she was the president of Stanford University. Mm. Uh, so I, yeah, she's a very smart woman, but very sweet. I can't respect anybody who got us into the Iraq war and she was the secretary. Wasn't she the secretary of state then? And Colin Powell was the secretary of defense or was it the reverse? Or maybe mm. she was the national security advisor and he was the secretary of state. I don't know. Anybody who got us into the Iraq war, I feel that was a, a million lives affected and it's, it's too much. That's the one, that's the one thing yeah. I don't like. Yeah. But what other political leaders do you respect? Oh, wow. Well, I don't know. Well, really. I, I, there's a, a vice president. Um, uh, I well, love Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. He's so sweet. Oh, but Just he as is. a person. Okay, as a person, he might be okay. And his, all his, you know, but work that he's doing right now. The Iran hostage I situation. No, 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 no. I, I know that. The that, coal that, miners strike. But what he does now is wonderful. All right, I'll go along with that. Yeah. Uh, there was a vice president in 1876, William Wheeler, and Rutherford B. Hayes was uh, the president. Won the presidency in 1876. Mm -hmm. Nobody. He. They got to the convention, and it was a, for the vice presidential pick. It was a nobody had a, a, a nobody was a front runner. So they picked this random guy, William Wheeler, who was a congressman from New York. And when Rutherford B. Hayes heard the name, hey, this guy's going to be your vice presidential nominee, Rutherford B. Hayes even said, I never even heard of this guy. But William Wheeler had voted against a pay raise for Congress. And he actually, 
he actually returned all the extra pay every year to the government. He refused to take the extra pay. And then um, somebody uh, offered him, hey, if you switch over the New York delegates to me, I'll give you whatever you want. And he, he would say, no money. William Miller said, no money in the world could pay for my dignity. Um, and so he was like a real honest guy. And uh, he, he's like the only person I could think of in American politics who was like totally non corrupt. Like every other president, if you yeah. say their name, I could think of some scandal that they've been in. But um, even, I don't know, even like Jimmy Carter, actually. So I mean, Billy Carter was always in some kind of scandal. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Well, no one's perfect. We're all human. You know, you it's know, not going to be a... Gerald Ford would have been an honest guy, but then who knows? He parted Nixon, so there's weirdness there. Uh, I don't know. There's just no perfect person. Well, hey, if I was president, I would be I would be perfect, but I'm, I'm unelectable. <laughs> so uh, let's see if there's any more uh, questions. Questions of the day. Uh should you use pay? Okay, if you do a newsletter, good question. If you do a newsletter, should you use paid advertising? And the answer is, oh, let me see who asked that. I'll say their name. Uh, Robert San Luis. So Robert San Luis, uh, Robert S A N L U I S. Uh, and the answer is, so should, question is, should you use advertising to advertise your paid newsletter? And the answer is absolutely. But don't drive people just to your most expensive product, drive people to the free newsletter. And it's in the free newsletter when you can, once they sign up then, you could communicate with them a lot more directly. That's how you sell the for pay newsletter. So do a giveaway, like give away a computer or an iPhone 11 or 20 of your favorite books, do some sort of lottery contest. Use software, here's a good kind of pro tip. Use software called King Sumo, K-A-N-G-S-U-M-O in order to create a contest that makes your email newsletter go viral and think of a giveaway do let's let's just imagine for a second it's a computer like a a, a three thousand dollar gaming computer setup and it's uh you're gonna you're gonna give it away you're gonna do a lottery you're gonna give away three of them to to people who sign up for your newsletter do advertising hey you know sign up for uh, uh, a parenting newsletter and win a gaming computer set up for your children, um, sign up right now, uh, blah, blah, blah. Get people to sign up for the newsletter. Use King Sumo. It's a, you'll see when you look it up that it's a way to make email newsletters go viral. And then that's for your free newsletter. And then you start advertising on your, and then you start on your free newsletter talking about your premium for pay newsletter. And, and that's how I would do it. So I would advertise the giveaway and advertise the content of your free newsletter get people to sign up and then, or maybe it's your 20 favorite parenting books. So it's at least subject relevant, mm -hmm. get people to sign up for the free newsletter, advertise the heck out of that, and then start mentioning your for pay newsletter on the free newsletter. Cause those are, those are your captive audience. Whereas the people you advertise to are not captive. Mm -hmm. uh, I would advertise on Facebook and I would advertise on podcasts like parenting podcasts. Yeah. That's good. I think podcasts where you have the podcaster read, in their own voice uh, uh, you know they like I have to approve ads for my podcast and then I read it in my own voice and I I don't approve products that I don't agree with so uh, then you have someone saying oh sign up for Robin's parenting newsletter and this is on a parenting podcast and then the person will say I've signed up it's great I like these headlines yeah. blah, blah blah and by the way she's also giving away uh, her 20 favorite parenting books sign up now and then use King Sumo, you'll see what it is when you Google it mm -hmm. to make it go viral. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you'll see, it's interesting. And then you use your, uh, in your newsletter, every issue of the newsletter, uh, you offer reasons for people to sign up for the for pay newsletter. Um, and again, also the best advertisement is if you write a book. So if Robin were to write my, the hundred best parents in history, then that, and then you include in the book, a link to your newsletter because people will download the book or they'll read the book and right on the front, hey, sign up for my free newsletter if you like this book. Um, and then boom, that's another way. And then writing a book gives you credibility. You don't need a publisher. You create XYZ Publishing. 
get a cover that's professionally done, upload it to Amazon, and then make an audible book, and then make a podcast even, and then boom, you're using the whole, what I call the spoken wheel technique. So parenting is the core, is at the wheel, and then one spoke is book, another spoke is free newsletter, another spoke is paid newsletter, another spoke is podcast, another spoke might be merchandising, so, and, and all that works together to drive people to your most expensive product, which is the for pay newsletter. I have the spoken wheel, the Altucher spoken wheel. Oh yes, yeah, so Altucher so, is like the core. Altucher is you, and I have the kids, I have the business, I have cooking, I have taking care of the house. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> the, I'm like the hubcap, <laughs> yeah. but by myself, I wouldn't be able to move very far because yeah. I would just get crushed. <laughs> by the weight of all of the car. And you're like the the real wheel yeah. that's inflated in every so if way. So I ever have time and, to write a book, I will do that. And, and, that's what, <laughs> and that's what drives the car. You're actually what yeah. enables the car to move forward, forward motion yeah. in the car. All right, I get it. <laughs> I'm fine with that, by the way. I am too. I'm fine. I love my job. Left to my own devices, I throw out all my belongings and live in Airbnbs. So it's certainly better with you around. You're not gonna let me throw out all my stuff and just move from Airbnb to Airbnb. Yeah. In fact, she moved in. I didn't recognize the apartment. Like all of a sudden- I came with baggage. You, you've they, lived, they, you've like, lived all over the world. Not, so I- Not I, the bad baggage, but- <laughs> I wa no, you had, you had baggage. And uh, don't- Stuff. So, so I go in, I come into the house after you move in and it's like, boom, like <laughs> everything. Like you've lived all over the world. So it was like statues from Africa staring at me and China, this Maoist, you know, figurines from Maoist China and stuff from the Middle East. There was, there was a, there was a gun. What was that gun? It was like from some general from the 1800s, uh, which we don't have anymore. Don't send the police over here. We gave it away. But who was that? Who was that gun from? There was like a famous gun. Well, we still have it. It's the, um, it's Don't Jean, tell them we Jean still have it. We'll send the police. So Jean Lafitte. Who's, well, it's, it's a antique that's. It yeah, doesn't it, work. It doesn't work. It's, it's from, Jean it's from Jean, like the 1200s. Jean Lafitte. He, no, it's not. He was a. Um, Camilla, Ye Camilla, Camilla Yang says, how often do you suggest to publish the newsletter? Good question. Here's what I would do. People like when you stay in touch with them. So I would put your free newsletter out every single day or at least three times a week, no less than three times a week. And then the for pay newsletter once a week. And that is the ideal ratio. If all you did was once a week, then your customers are not going to be as eager. They're going to forget about you. You have to have some content that reaches people each week. Uh, and so I would do a free newsletter uh, every day or three times a week. And then a for pay one, once a week, but people like to feel that you're keeping in touch with them. A friend of mine, um, oh, there's only one minute left. I could talk more about this tomorrow. I love the newsletter business. I think it's a great way. And I'm going to talk about this in conjunction with online courses tomorrow as well. Maybe some stock stuff. Oh, and then I want to talk about this other massive business idea I have cliffhanger, but you'll love this idea tomorrow, 2 PM that I'm going to save this to IG, my IGTV, YouTube, podcasting. Jay will put it up on YouTube right away. Uh, and I'll put it on IGTV, podcast. Robin, thanks once thank again you. for oh, thank you. joining us. Thanks, everybody. Are you ready to take control of your future and be your own boss? At Neighborly, we'll help you go into business for yourself but not by yourself. As a neighborly franchise owner, you'll join a community with thousands of passionate and experienced entrepreneurs. With 19 franchise brands providing a variety of home service needs, you'll benefit from decades of established systems and support. Learn more about neighborly franchising by downloading your free guide at go.nbly.com slash podcast.